Well, thank you very, very much, Postolos, and thank you for everybody else. I know it's been a very long day. Um, and so this is shifting slightly over to education today. So these are my details, and it has my email, but right at the end of the slides will also be my email there that if anyone else wants to follow on the conversation, I'd like to do so. So UNHCR, so I'm just giving some quick details here, but many of you have seen great details already. These are the latest figures I got from UNHCR. So um, as it explains, the situation is worrying on Lesbos, Chicos, Samos, and Leros, which have received the largest number of arrivals, including many children. More than half have come from conflict in Syria and Iraq. In August 2017, there have been 3,695 sea arrivals compared to 2,249 in July 2017. And as many people know now, um, lately in the last few months, that's jumped up again, figures. Um, the arrivals in Lesbos, Samos and Leros have now outpaced the rate in which people are being authorized by the authorities to transfer to the mainland. Estimated departures for the mainland last month, which was August, were 2,561 against 3,695 3, arrivals. And talking specifically about Lesbos, in August there were 1,052 arrivals and over 700 in the first week of September. And in total, there's about 5,000. Again, these are certain figures that are always changing, but that just gives you some ideas of what numbers we're looking at. I don't know if you're familiar with the SDGs and the Millennium Development Goals. So basically what happens is the United Nations gets together with their 193 states and decide what we want the future to look like. And they developed in 2000 to 2015 the Millennium Development Goals and the education for all. And part of one of those was that all children should have education. Um, they met a lot of those goals, although they found other issues, such as they got children into the classrooms and into classrooms in many different places, but then they realized they didn't have educators to work with the children. So they had a lot of things like this. Um, 2015, each um, 15 years, they make a new set. So in 2015 to 2030, they develop the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and again, um, goal four mentions, which shows on there, um, ensure inclusive and quality education for all and promote lifelong learning. Putting it bluntly, education is a human right a tool of personal empowerment, expression, and a means to social, cultural, and human development. It's a way of, for people to express themselves. It gives them the power to do that. Education is very important. We've heard a lot from speakers talking about what we're doing now, about um, keeping them warm, all sorts of things like this. These are absolutely crucial things. However, a lot of worry comes from what is the future going to look like? Many children here, many adults are wanting to learn, wanting to integrate into environments, wanting to learn the Greek culture, um, wanting a future certification that when they arrive somewhere, that they have skills, knowledge that they can then use to say to people, look, I have these, this education, you know, I'd like to get a job. So these are crucial things that without, they know they're greatly lacking. What I did is um, I worked in one particular camp. Um, the name's actually going to be removed from this video when it goes on the web. But I worked in Karatepe in doing some research, which I'm going to present on the brief findings today, just for the fact that it's only been in the last few days that I've done this research. Um, so these are the very initial findings. So as you can see, the various, I put it as camps because they've obviously got different roles. 
but um, Karatepe is a very organized camp, very different than Moray. So these are the two things I did. I conducted an educational needs analysis, and I also looked at mobile learning, whether mobile learning was something that we could use to extend and enhance what they already had in the camp. So before I go into the details, I want to be really clear on what mobile learning has, because I have a specific conception of what it is, and I know individually many people have very different things. So um, this is the research so far. Um, and I'm not going to actually read it out to you. I'll let you read there. But basically, it's saying that mobile learning is something that's sustainable. It's something that could be used in um, many situations like this. I've, I've been fortunate enough to look at mobile learning for UNESCO and groups like that to see how it can empower women and girls, um, work with refugees to extend their learning. And the way I've done that is by not just doing my research, but looking what is out there. So I've had the time through my university to explore all the different research. And people have had the questions, you know, kind of what do academics bring to this? They can bring a great deal, especially when we have this information of what works and what doesn't. Because what we perceive as that will be effective, when you actually do the research, you can find very different. So my work was that I gathered all the research together and looked at what was positive, what was negative, and how it should work. So that's what knowledge I brought to this project today. So a little bit more about mobile learning. Mobile learning is not to replace a teacher. It's not to replace education. It is a tool. It's like saying, oh, you're getting books. Does that mean books are going to replace the teacher? It sounds silly, doesn't it? It sounds silly to me when people think that devices can replace teachers and things. Devices are just a tool. However, they're a very powerful tool that can be used to great advantage. As I put on there, it's efficient, scalable, and cost-effective. It's not tethered. In other words, we don't have to have a cable and plug it in. We only do that occasionally. And then we can walk away and students can use devices wherever they are. It's affordable in many cases. They're getting cheaper and cheaper as they're going along. And there's a lot of packages out there where um, you can get bulk um, a lot cheaper. And it's efficient in what it does. It can provide resources. Textbooks and things like that, they're actually, um, as you'll see, when I went to the camp here, they've got a lot of great books. They've got great libraries and things. But the thing is, you're never going to be able to have enough for what the children really would need. For example, a child comes in, speaks a particular language. Do you have a book for that? Do you have a book for their level? Um, a lot of children are learning mathematics. They're learning in a different language, so they're having to think a different language as well as learning the mathematics. That is extremely hard to do. So what about if you have resources that could teach them in that language? So think of mobile learning that way. It's a tool to be used in the classroom or as homework or whatever else is needed. If a student's got a disability, maybe they need to access somewhere else before they can get into the school. So what I use for this educational needs assessment is I use the tool just over there, the Joint Educational Needs Assessment Toolkit. This has been used for many emergency situations, um, earthquakes, all sorts of things. And so it's, it has specific questions and things like that that I used. It's also a tool for ongoing emergencies like we have here. So I did three data collections. I did a primary data collection, secondary, and site summary data, which are just quickly here. Um, the one you're probably most interested there, the primary data collection, is I spoke to many families. 
I used translators that they had there, but then I actually found that um, I worked with many of families and they translated as well for me, which was very useful. Um, I talked to the parents, I talked to the camp manager, and so on. And then I got, obviously, from other places, statistics, um, talking to um, the municipality, and so on. The data collection could be huge. I just looked at these key things here. Can you click on for me? Thank you. Um, just a little bit back. <laughs> just one more, I think. Um, the bottom arrow buttons. Um, a good bit more, I think it went to the end there. Oh, well, you're going backwards. <laughs> I should get everyone to close their eyes at this point, shouldn't I, so you can't see what other slides there are. Okay, let, yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, so these are the overall findings here. You've got um, someone there that's coordinating a lot of things. You have got many, many different um, groups that are supporting NGOs. Um, you have a lot of movement, they have um, permanent teachers, but they have a lot of voluntary teachers coming in and going, as well as obviously children they're, and adults, learners, they're coming and going, so everything's very transient. So that is obviously um, a difficulty when you're teaching. A very important thing is they are not a school at the camp. They are non-formal learning. They cannot provide any accreditation. They are preparing the students for moving into the other schools. So this is a stepping stone that they're allowed to do there. They're allowed to work with the children at the schools that they have there, the educational blocks, um, and prepare them, like I said, going in. And they focus on mathematics, literacy, um, Greek, they actually focus a great deal on geography because that's a crucial thing that people want to know where they're going and where does it look like and whereabouts is it on the map. So these are the one of the, some of the main findings I have here. And so I don't have to look behind. I'll bring it up on my mobile device, model what I'm talking about. Okay, so access and learning environment. I looked at um, physical, discrimination, language barriers, gender-based, le legal, and security. And what we found is, and again, these are very brief, quick findings. Um, the physical environment actually is great. Um, I'm, I'm very surprised that they have a great deal more than many other villages that I typically go to. They have all sorts of paths there for students with um, wheelchairs again, of any ages, not just going all the way around, but they're actually getting direct access to the schools. They've got many languages there. They have educational buildings, multiple all over the camps, and there are no feelings of danger. I've done another study in Jordan, looking at children there that in the refugee camps going to schools, and they faced a lot of issues getting to the schools from other refugees and other, just various things. And there was no feeling of that here. Looking at teaching and learning, and I'm sorry, I'm going through these quickly for time. Looking at teaching, learning, curricula, training. Again, as I said, it's non-formal learning. They cannot get certificates there. But the grades and progress, um, they're not formally followed, because it's very, very difficult. Um, again, because of the movement, and there's no specific tests at the beginning of things. However, the teachers actually do note what the students are doing, what level they're up to, what they need next, just on an informal method. But it seems to be working very effectively. And again, there are the subjects, 
the soft skills I talk about there, if they're also learning sewing and other things that they'd like to focus on that they've asked for. The teachers, only qualified teachers are used. Um, they're prepared to work with refugees. They're also prepared um, psychologically themselves to work in those type of environments. Um, and they're all supervised by the camp manager and obviously the agencies that they're connected to. Gender and psychosocial, just putting those quickly together. At the schools, the, both the teachers and all the children and families report that they're getting, there we go, they're having peace education and conflict mitigation and resolution um, education, health, nutrition and hygiene, promotion, violence prevention, including sexual and gender based social cohesion and awareness of risk. So they're being told about these, and that's part of their education that they're getting there at the camp, which is great to hear, because again, we've worked at many places, and those subjects, surprisingly relevant and not covered. And very, very quickly, childhood development and youth and adults. So um, very young children don't have a great deal at the moment there. Um, they seem to be um, doing a lot of really time fillers, painting lots of nice stuff that the parents would like to see a little bit more for the younger children because that will, again, prepare them to go further into other schools and prepare them to be at the same level as other children. So that's one area that could be improved. Um, obviously, for adults and youths, they can't get out and work at other places. Um, but they can do a lot in the camp, and they are used a great deal there. It was very interesting. When I went around to see many families, they'd have to check the schedule to see <laughs> when they could always meet with me, because um, um, they were doing many things around the camp, which was great. So, last two slides. For mobile learning, this is what I found. So. All families had at least one mobile device, and they actually found it very funny that I was asking the question. It's as if, of course we have. Um, it's the first thing they would tell me that they would grab from the home, despite, you know, obviously children and family members. And that was one of the first things it would take for the fact that it's what keeps them connected. It what, it's what empowers them to be able to do many things. And that's why we've got to think, why should it not be used for education? There is Wi-Fi at the camp. However, it's not very strong. It has little hotspot areas, but that could be greatly improved. Some families are using mobile devices to teach the children. Remember, for very young, they're using them often for alphabet in English and Greek uh, and things like that. Um, but they would find it very, very useful if the school started using mobile devices there. But um, around where the school was, the Wi-Fi connectivity was very, very low around those points. The teachers um, were very typical. Um, funny enough, everywhere around the world when I speak to teachers, some will say, yes, mobile devices are great. Um, I use it for this, I've seen it used for this in classrooms. But you also have the other teachers um, that are saying, oh, I don't know if it would be useful, I'm not quite sure. And they've not got a frame of reference from using it themselves before. And a lot of times we think of technology for younger people, thinking that they're very tech savvy. But that's actually, as I've found, not always the case because many um, younger people came through school at a time where mobile devices were seen as very negative in many parts of the world. And so again, that transition over is very, very difficult. So it could have um, benefits they, they see, but they're not, they couldn't think of how they would use them. So going forward, again, these are very rough findings and what I believe um, would be beneficial would obviously stronger internet infrastructure, more access to mobile devices, actually having some there for people to use, 
they are very, very highly prized possessions. People would have them very close. And I spoke to someone that had one um, stolen who was extremely upset that she lost this empowerment, lost this connectivity. So it'd be great if um, there were ways that we could have mobile devices for there when they're learning. And there are many ways to do that. Again, we don't have time just now to explain some of those. But um, knowledge as well about various programs, I'm sure that you've all heard of, oh, this group are using this program, this group are using this program. There are many programs. I am not, well, that's what's nice about being not connected to a particular program, not funded by any particular um, NGO, program, grant. I see what is available. I work with um, UNESCO on a lot of projects where they look at mobile learning for all different people. And there is so much available, so much free. The, there's a great misconception that young children know what they're doing all the time with devices, that they can use them for all these things. That's not actually fully true. They feel very confident. They can use it for things that they recognize, YouTube, social networking. But for learning, they're not always aware of all the different programs out there that they could use. So it'd be great if they could um, be showing what's available, so they don't even have to go through a teacher. They could do it on their own devices if they want. Google Translate is one I've been using greatly in the last few days. Um, training the educators, because you cannot just put devices in. People need to be prepared to be thinking about how you can use it, what it looks like. And training cannot just be put in and left as that. Of, OK, you've had your training. Go ahead. You know, I'm sure you'll be fine. It needs ongoing support from somebody to be able to connect and make sure that people do know what they're doing. And when they feel comfortable using something, they can be perhaps shown something else that they could use. So thank you very much. There's my email if anyone has any questions. And thank you.